So we are told by all the quote unquote experts to be fearless, don't be scared. And from a young age, like parents do this, the world does this, don't be scared, don't worry, don't stress, don't feel guilty. We always say, don't feel what you feel. <laughs> Instead mm -hmm. of saying, cool, feel what you feel. And that's okay to feel what you feel. There's nothing inherently wrong with you. So, and that's the problem. Like I've worked with one guy who said, I'm just waiting for the fear to go away so I can quit my job and start my business. And I said, you're, that's your fundamental problem. You're waiting for the fear to go away because he thought he should be, we're told all the time, just be confident as you step into action. Like you cannot be confident at something you've never done before. How are you going to be confident? You've never done it. It's going to be scary. Confidence is the result, not the fuel. So the fundamental in terms of the perception is to stop trying to be fearless, stop trying to not be scared. If fear shows up, there's nothing wrong with you. Like it's not bad, you're not weak for feeling it. And this is a big problem. People feel they're weak for feeling fear. Welcome to Empowered Kids TV, where we introduce you to the people and ideas to help you take action and create the family of your dream. Our guest today is a Marine Corps veteran, an adventurer, speaker, coach, and entrepreneur. He overcame a lifestyle of drug addiction in high school, joined the United States Marine Corps, and served for seven months in Iraq, where his job was literally to be the human bomb detection device. He credits this as just the beginning of his understanding of the positive power of fear and struggle. He has dragged a 190 pound sled 350 miles across the world's second largest polar ice cap for a month, swam through underwater caves, has almost been killed by falling boulder while glacier caving, experienced severe altitude sickness while climbing the Himalayas and suffered through heat exhaustion while running across several countries. But his greatest struggle came many years after the war as he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and consequently struggled with depression and alcohol addiction that drove him to his darkest places. He spent years studying neuroscience, psychology and spirituality to heal his own brain and figure out what it takes to live a happy, successful and meaningful life. For me, our guest's almost daredevil-like approach to life is intriguing and as I realized he pushed himself to the brink doing crazy things like sitting in complete darkness for seven days to find a part to deeper understanding and mastery of his mind. So please help me to welcome a man who is on a mission to help us all make fear our ally so that we can fully live our worthy struggle. Ashke Navanati. Ashke, welcome to Empowered Kids TV. Thank you. I want to start right on the cover. Um, and ask why the, the word fearvana? You know, I can't take full credit for coming up with that word, but uh, my ex-wife came up with it. We had, but I had really been living this lifestyle. And what I wanted to do was share everything I had learned from coming out of that dark moment when I was on the brink of suicide after uh, coming back from the war, battling PTSD, depression and everything. And taking all the lessons I'd learned from the neuroscience and the psychology from the spirituality, as well as all my life experience, I wanted to help people combat their negative association with the word fear, with words like stress, with anxiety, suffering, pain, adversity. Anywhere I go, to this day, when I do speeches around the world, I'll often show these words on, on, when I start my speech, and I'll ask people, how many of you think of them as positive? Nobody. Nobody thinks of these as positive words. And so the idea was, let's help people reframe that. So originally, the book was actually going to be called The Other Side of Fear. And you know, while that's okay, but it just kind of sounds like every other thing yeah, right yeah, yeah, and so yeah. she came up with the word fear vana and it was it just clicked it was like that's that's what i've been doing i've been living this lifestyle of turning fear into nirvana you know and uh when she did it was i mean it just stuck and i bought like 50 different domain names associated with fear vana <laughs> <laughs> and i knew i knew that was it i give her full credit for it she's uh i mean we're still friends to this day great person great soul and uh she really got that, that this is what I was trying to communicate. And she crystallized the essence of the lifestyle I've been living. She crystallized it by giving it a name. Lovely. That's really beautiful. For me, when, as, as I go through the book um, and I try to really embody some of the concepts and some of them, I will be honest, I had to meditate on for a bit just yeah. to kind of go deeper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, it's that merging of uh, that spiritual element 
-hmm. as well as the cognitive ability that you're, mm -hmm. you're trying to come up with mental tools. Mm -hmm. It seems to be that beautiful dance in the middle um, of those cognitive and that spiritual tool that, that really just helps you to find peace and see the power in fear, whereas kind of run and turn from it, which is what we're used mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Very much kind of molding the spiritual, the cognitive, the being, the doing it's all, it's not, it's, you know, like science and spirituality is sometimes framed as opposites, but that's not the case, right? They can absolutely coexist. And, and like you said, in fear Vaughn is a testament to that. I mean, the amount of research I did, the, you can see, you, you read it, you know, the amount of research that went into it, the backing it up with the studies, but the essence of it is that you have to live it. You, cause you can read a book, you can listen to me talk, <laughs> nothing is going to get you to understand. And I have actually a great example of this is a friend of mine. She read it and she was like, you know, that's great. I get it. But she only really got it when she did the, uh, that walk in from, I think it's in Spain to France. The, the, it's like a huge hike. I forget the name of it now. It's this monstrous hike over like 40 days or something like that. And it really tested her physically. Mm -hmm. And she, then she, I remember she sent me a WhatsApp voice note and she's like, now I get fear. <laughs> you know, like it's one thing to cognitively understand it once it's one, it's another thing to live it. And the whole, okay. I mean, that's why the last words in my book is get out there and wander. Cause it's like, you got to go into the, in, into yourself to experience that. That's where you truly understand it. You said that the first step in identifying um, Fevana is, is being aware and accepting the way that the mind works. In fact, mm -hmm. you said the more you fight against the way your mind works, the less you'll be able to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what you think fear really is and what mm -hmm. causes it. Yeah, so fear is the brain's very normal response to the unknown, to anything. Because one thing you got to really remember is that the brain doesn't care how happy you are. The brain's primary function is keeping you alive. And we are designed for an archaic world where we have to deal with life-threatening scenarios externally all the time, right? Like caveman, cavewoman, like lifestyles, right? That's our brain is still designed for that world. It's not designed for this world. So anything that's unknown, anything that's perceived as a threat, your brain's, and again, this is obviously a very simplified, but it's a good way to perceive, understand it this way. Your brain's asking the question, is this thing going to kill me or not, right? And so fear is the response to that. And this is why it baffled me why we demonize fear. Like, it's just a normal human response to life. It's not bad. It's not good. It's, what, it's whatever you want it to be. It can, it's anything. There are no bad or good emotions, right? So like right now, if I'm sitting in this room and somebody comes into this room with a gun, I'm not going to choose to feel fear. I'm not going to say, let me feel afraid. My brain will <laughs> respond with fear. And that's a good thing because when your brain gets into that heightened state, and this is, I've experienced it in war. I've experienced it climbing mountains in very intense life or death situations. When it gets to that heightened state, it narrows your focus for the fight ahead, for the battle ahead. Now, of course, in this world, it's, we're not dealing with life-threatening uh, scenarios all the time. So what happens is people, when you're not trained to navigate that fear, to navigate the, uh, the, the communication essentially between the emotional brain and the, what I call the human brain, the, the, the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain associated with rationality, awareness, if you don't train yourself to navigate that, that communication, the subconscious will control you. It will mm -hmm. control you. And that's what happens. So people get paralyzed by fear. They get paralyzed by anxiety and they don't let don't allow it to work for them so the, so the fundamental ethos of fearvana is to accept that fear is not bad that no emotion is bad there are no bad or good emotions they're just emotions and most of the time we don't even control their response they just are just our subconscious is responding to stimuli so when you accept that then you can then you can the biggest value in doing that is you stop judging yourself because mm -hmm. what happens is people start to not fear fear they, it's not just the fear, but they fear fear. So they do things to run away from fear. They do things to run away from stress, anxiety. And the idea is, cool, these things are going to show up. Like, I'm not, I'm not some daredevil who's fearless. I get terrified everything I do. I was terrified <laughs> writing a book on fear, you know? So it's, it's not that I'm fearless. I do these things because they're scary. And so when I've learned to accept and normalize fear, that's allowed me to then transcend it and do something with it. I love it. And I think from that, I can see why you say fear isn't the enemy of love, but mm -hmm. rather the expression of it. Which Absolutely. Is so beautiful. Absolutely. This was, thank you. Thank you. No, this was something that was really important to me because again, you, we, we hear this in the personal development and spiritual circles a lot, right? Like there's fear and there's love. There's only two ways of being and you choose love as if fear is the bad guy. And that's not the case. I mean, fear is not the enemy of love. It's an expression of it. Like, why am I afraid of, um, and I've been in a point in my life where I was not afraid of dying. When I was in Iraq, I was not afraid of dying. I was, if death came, great, awesome. Like I'm ready to go, you know? And that's not healthy, obviously. <laughs> Today, I am afraid of dying. And so, because I value my life more. 
Or why are we afraid of something bad happening to our kids or people we love because we love them, right? So reframing our fear as love is a really powerful tool to help us then look at that fear and use that fear in service of something more meaningful. You say that fear seems like rather than try to find out if your fear is irrational or rational, so stop labeling it. Mm -hmm. um, and really, you think that in, in our drive to label our fear, we're missing the point. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you said is that what we really need to do is to shift the mindset so that we begin to start to see fear as our ally. And you've quoted, and I've pulled out another quote, your book is just so full of quotes that I love. Like, I feel like I can put them <laughs> all over the world. It's that since our brains always choose fear over reason to keep us alive, evolutionary speaking, it would make sense that the brain finds a way to harness that fear. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, part of it when in the, in especially in extreme scenarios, like in war, for example, you know, I, I mentioned right at the start of the book, one of my friends who ran into a burning Humvee to save a fellow Marine. Now, in a situation like that, when you want fear to take over, because when fear takes over, it channels your focus, it releases adrenaline, it releases these neurochemicals that allows you to do things like stepping into a burning Humvee, it, it puts you into that fight mode, right? So the brain knows what happens when it's, a, when it's in a true life or death. It, it, you don't want to be pausing. Like if a shark is attacking you, you don't want to be thinking about, hmm, what should I do in this, right? You want to <laughs> respond instantly. And that's what fear does. It channels your focus. It, it allows, it sends neurochemicals to parts of you that allow you to be right into the fight. And again, we have to train in it. Otherwise, what happens in, in especially in today's environment where we are constantly taught easy is better, comfort is better. We're in this kind of softening world. We're not trained in fear. So when it shows up, we tend to like the paradigm that we've set is we'll just, you know, flight, like f fight or flight, right? Like, and again, there's more than just that response, but we've created a paradigm that people are now more conditioned to respond to fear in kind of a negative way. But if we train ourselves, we can embrace it and harness it. So the idea is, exa is exactly that. You want to step into your fears, recognizing it that, I mean, I call it the neurochemical, the, co the chemical cocktail of fear of honor, right? Like endorphins, anandamide. And the word anandamide, it's a neurotransmitter that comes from the word, san the, the word anand in Sanskrit, which literally means bliss. And there's still a lot of research to be done to it, but they've shown that like this kind of chemical releases itself in experiences of novelty. So when you push yourself, when things are unknown, that's why we like doing exciting things. You know, we like jumping out of planes. We, when we, and who do we admire? If you look at human <laughs> beings collectively since the, you get it right. So, I mean, and we admire people who have transcended adversity, who've done things that leap into the unknown that have pushed the boundaries of what's possible because that's neurochemically in a way we're wired for that. And it's kind of a paradox because at the same time, we're also wired for comfort. Like again, exist, like if you look, come, coming back to uh, archaic man, archaic woman, we, we, comfort was not the norm. We lived in a hostile environment. So when comfort happened, it was like, thank God, right? Like now I get to be comfortable. So comfort was the thing we sought out because comfort was not the norm. Now we live in a world where comfort is the norm. So we have a world of excess and we get an accl acclimatized to it because doing hard things is obviously hard. That's the nature of hard things. They suck. It's difficult. So we're kind of wired in this very paradoxical way. And you see this happen all the time. Like I'm a clear cut example of this. I was born to a good life, great parents. I mean, I don't have to be doing all the nonsense that I do. Like, like <laughs> running. I mean, just yesterday, just yesterday, I finished running 24 hours. It was an exercise in pure suffering to run 24 hours. I'm still kind of limping around. It's still hurting. I don't have to do this nonsense. Oh, right? you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I slept like a good 11, 12 hours uh, last <laughs> night. Otherwise, if I had just finished this morning, this would not be going down this way, this conversation. <laughs> I would have been a mental wreck. Uh, but I do these things because the, the, the value you attain in pushing yourself that far is indescribable. I mean, I think it's the apex of the human experience is the collection of these moments, you know? So it's about striving for them and recognizing the inherent paradox in the human condition that we're all, we're wired for both. And who we choose to be is ultimately who we choose to be. Like what happens in both those battles is who we choose. And any day of the week, I would argue and neuroscience to back it up, spiritually to back it up, the path to seek out a meaningful struggle is always better than the path to seek out comfort. Because look, if you don't seek out, I always like to say, if you don't seek out a worthy struggle, struggle is going to find you anyway. One way or the other, we are all going to suffer in life. And if you don't, and it's going to be, I can promise you, it is far easier for me to do the thing like pushing myself into do 24 hour runs than it is for that moment where I was choosing not to do anything with my life, struggling with depression, drinking, and, and, and PTSD. Like I've been on both corners of the spectrum. And I will tell you, I will choose 24 hours running any day of the week.
And it does, and, and like one, one thing to be clear, it doesn't have to be that. Like you don't have to run 24 hours. <laughs> the, the key thing is like find your own worthy struggle, right? Like whatever your path is, it can be anything. We all have raising a child, you know, hosting a show, writing a book, uh, anything. The point is find out what, like what being a legend, being a champion means to you and pursue that path. Do you think that our, our discomfort with the feeling of fear is what makes us try to put it in a box of rational or irrational and to, you know, yeah. I'll, like yeah. I'll give you an example. So I think when it comes to a fear of heights, I have two, two paths to it. Like I can talk myself through moving in action with the fear for the climb. So I can climb up a wall. Mm. I can just zone in and keep focus on the next move. Right. Mm. But when I get to the top of the wall, my fear of falling is mm-hmm. so immense that I can't come down. So I remember I took my kids, I took my kids wall climbing. And I had built, been rock climbing before, but in that tandem way where somebody else is holding the rope down below. So there's that kind of taut, tight yeah. rope feel, right? Yeah. So you still feel secure on the way back down. But I took them wall climbing and we went to the center that had sort of a bungee cord at the top. Hmm. So when you held on to come down, there was no tour. It just felt like you were going to just drop into oblivion. <laughs> and I raced them up the wall and I was like, yeah, I won. And then it took me 15 minutes with my hands shaking and I couldn't let go to come down. Yeah. I had to climb yeah. down the wall because <laughs> of the fear. And so for me, I said, that was irrational. Like I knew I was safe. I knew there was no- everybody else was coming down the wall. My kids came up three times trying yeah. to get me down. So... In, in that moment, is it because instead of trying to lean into fear, we're trying to deny it so we get trapped in that space? Yeah. No, and that's a great example of seeing that the rational brain and the fear brain are not on the same page. Like, <laughs> rationally, you get it, right? Rationally, you get it. And I've been there, too. Like, when I went skydiving, every part of me knew that, like, rationally, it's all good. The odds of the boat shoots not opening are really, really low. But I was terrified. I was actually driving to the drop zone, hoping that it would rain. Like a part of me was hoping that it rained so I can skip the jump, you know? And obviously I ended up going there, I I did jump, but I was terrified. So exactly to your point that the rational brain and the fear brain are not always on the same page. And the key thing is to recognize that and be like, cool, we're not on the same page. Rationally, I might know this is not scary. The odds of anything happening are like near zero, all good. My fear brain's gonna do what it's do, do what it does. And so the the thing is to recognize that and to acknowledge that you don't control that response. And that's why I don't like labeling fears as irrational or rational. Like you don't label the heart or the liver as rational or irrational, right? They just do what they do. There's no, there's no, you can't assign rationality to like sort of a thing like that, right? Like there's nothing irrational or rational about this bot. It's just there. And so the thing is, when you, when you, when you, when you recognize you don't control your subconscious, you stop, or ideally you want to stop deeming it as rational or irrational. It just does what it does. Who cares? I acknowledge its presence and I'm not trying to label it, not trying to give meaning to it. I get, then get to decide. And when I do that, then I can say, okay, what am I going to do with it? Like the fear of falling is very, cause see when you're climbing and I, I, I was a big rock climber for a long time. When you're climbing, you're kind of in control, right? Like, so there's, there's also an element of control. Like you can feel your hands on the wall when you let go. And it, so rationally, you're like, I just climbed up. Why am I afraid of falling? But when you let, let, let go, suddenly you've lost control. Now you're, now you're free falling in gravity. And that's, that's a different kind of fear than just the height, right? So, but acknowledging and be like, so you can pause and notice it and say, okay, this is, I'm afraid. This is perhaps why I'm afraid. What am I going to do? And then you decide, you know, and like, like base jumpers, I've talked, I've, I've interviewed, I've, I've seen base jumpers and base jumpers. Most, I can't speak to all of them because I, I don't know how everybody thinks, but I've talked to a lot of base jumpers who they feel terrified every time before they jump off a cliff, <laughs> but they've just learned to step into that fear. I feel terrified before going on a 24 hour run. I was terrified because I know how miserable it's going to be. I know the suffering I'm going to experience. And I was scared, but I know to step into that. So, because I also, I just don't judge it. Like to this day, I mean, I live in a very safe, nice neighborhood in Jersey. And I've had moments where, cause I live alone, where I'll suddenly feel like this pangs of fear and anxiety about being alone. And it's like the weirdest thing. I've done insanely dangerous things. Like I'm living in a nice home in a comfortable home and I'm afraid and anxious. And I'm like, but the thing is now I, I don't care. I don't, I don't judge it. I'm like, cool, you're there, whatever. It's almost like I'm talking to my brain as if it's a different part of me. You know what I mean? And by doing that, you now can choose outside of it. And that's why I don't like labeling it as rational or irrational or good or bad. It just is. And I don't even control it. 
now when I, and then, and when you do that, then you can, you build that line of communication between the subconscious and the conscious and you train yourself to disidentify from the subconscious. Like this is, this is kind of the essence of it is this. You're not your thoughts. You're not your feelings. You're not your experiences. You are the thinker of your thoughts, the feeler of your feelings and the experiencer of your experiences. So the more you master that space between what is and who you choose to be outside of what is, the more you can do something about it. So like a key mantra that I often use is be with what is, but do not become what is. And using mantras is a very powerful tool. So like you could be in that moment, top of the rock wall, fear is there. It's there. Cool. Be with what is, but do not become what is using mantras to then transcend the, the, and so when you do a mantra and I have, I have different mantras for all kinds of, I'm, I'm big into like using mantras to, to, to guide me in certain states of being, because in that moment now, suddenly I have let go of the paralytic element of that fear, right? Now I'm saying, this is not me. This thing is there. Cool. What am I going to be instead? We're going to talk in a bit about like you labeled three sort of identified three sort of key areas we need to look at in transcending our relationship to fear. But before we look at that, I wanted to ask, does it matter where your source of fear comes from? So like falling, I think falling for me is a fear because I fell as an infant and as a, as a, as a toddler mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. fell and I, and I split my head and had stitches. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the fall, but I can feel like that fear is yeah. linked to that. We'll but some fears, you. some fears are like primitive, like being afraid of spiders. They just yeah. seem to just be innate. Does it matter where the source of the fear comes from? You know, I would argue no. So ultimately there's two kinds of fears. There's learned and genetic. So learned obviously is fears we learn. So like something like that, when you fall at young age, so you might not vividly remember it, but that the trauma of that, because when you go through intense experiences, your brain plasters it into the amygdala, the kind of the quote unquote fear center of the brain. It plasters it in there deeper than normal experiences. And evolutionary speaking, that makes sense, right? Your brain wants to say, okay, this thing was dangerous. It could kill me. I better be on hyper alert, right? So evolutionary, that makes sense. Now then there's the genetic fears and they've done all kinds of studies to show like different fears. Like they've done one where they took snakes to uh, uh, people in the Inuit communities who've never seen a snake before in their life and they'll be terrified mm -hmm. of it, you know? And they've, uh, and they've done different kinds of fears. So, but, but every kind of fear, if you look at it, even the paradoxical one, so fear of tight spaces, evolutionary makes sense, right? Tight spaces could mean I could be overpowered and being killed. Fear of open spaces also makes sense evolutionary. And they're both completely <laughs> contradictory, right? But fear of open spaces also makes sense because now I could be attacked from all angles by a lion or whatever, right? So you have these kind of contrasting fears that both make sense evolutionary speaking. And then there's the learned fears because of what we go through. So the key thing is now, you know, while especially when it comes to learned fears and like deep seated trauma and stuff like that, there is va there's definite value in like going into your subconscious, tapping into the darkness so you can know what to do with it. Like Carl Jung puts it beautifully, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So you want to know what's going on there, why it's there. But the key thing always at any point is to remember it's what you do with it. So you can through behavior change, like people often say belief change behavior, but through behavior, you can change beliefs. It's not just a one way street. It's not just belief changes behavior. Behavior changes belief. Like I wasn't always the kind of person who did this. I used to be terrified of Ferris wheels, terrified of Ferris wheels, like let alone roll, not even roller coasters, like a Ferris wheel, which is absurd, right? It's the slow moving thing. I can't even that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, 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 it's insane. Like I was terrified of every, my mom will tell you, I was like just, you know, just this kid terrified of everything. And now look at me, right? So I built myself into this. So I'm big into just doing the purposeful action. And then it, it's kind of, again, it's both have their place. It's the duality changing through behavior and going deep into the conscious. So navigating and tapping into the darkness of the stuff we go through so we can learn how to use it instead of it controlling us. Like as in another example, when I came back, I struggled with survivor's guilt from the war, lost a friend in the war. And I was doing everything to run away from that. Everything, drinking, every, and sometimes even the positive things like skiing across an ice cap that the one, you know, 190 pounds set across the ice cap. That was before I ended up sobering up because I was doing things to push myself to the edges so I don't have to go in there and confront my demons. So it's all about that self-awareness to recognize that. So now I still do things like that, right? But I'm doing it from a very different level of consciousness. And so now I know the distinction because I've confronted that survivor skill. And I even learned to make it work for me because again, it's not a bad emotion. Guilt is just an expression of love. Like for a long time, I had a picture of my friend that I lost in the war up on my wall. And it said, this should have been you, earn this life. Mm -hmm. And that's an intense thing to look at, but it worked for me. 
my guilt drove me to finish writing this book, to focusing my life on, on, on doing something meaningful, on serving others, helping people navigate their own darkness and their suffering. So depending on the stuff that goes through, like there's value in going into those spaces and in and, 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 and the subconscious to, to be with them. And that's going to be a horribly difficult journey. There's nothing easy about confronting that stuff. But the, the faster you do that, the faster you'll come out on the other side of it. Like another quick, great example of this, I was doing this interview with Dr. Drew and somebody had called in, they had been in the Boston bombing and she was going through kind of PTSD as a result of that. And she was kind of asking a lot of questions to Dr. Drew asking me and how to handle that. And at one point she said, I was kind of saying that, okay, the next time you feel the symptoms, I really want you to stay with them and not try to run away with them. Like, let's say you hear loud noise and it makes you jump. Don't try to distract yourself, be with that. And she was like, that's really uncomfortable. And I said, obviously that's uncomfortable, but you're going to have to go into those spaces to get on the other side of them. So your brain has created a response. So you got to be with it, notice it, like be with fully with that pain, experience it. Like I had to be with my guilt instead of running away from it. And only then could I do something about it. Like mm-hmm. another two of my favorite column quotes. One is that, you know, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. And the other one is one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light but by making the darkness conscious. Mm. Love that one. And, you, and it's hard. Making, going into those dark spaces within our own soul is not easy. But I mean, that's why I went into the seven-day darkness retreat. I'm not saying everybody should do that, but it, it'll, it'll accelerate your spiritual evolution like nothing else will. <laughs> I want to talk more about that because that one really intrigued me. So I definitely <laughs> want to dive deeper into that one. You talk about using fear to either help us or hinder us, right? That's the reality of it. But you broke it down into three things. The way we perceive it, the way we train for it, and who we choose to be outside of it. And I want to kind of cover those three in a bit more detail. So talk to us about, and we've touched on it before as as we've been talking, but how do we typically perceive fear in a way that hinders us from using it in, in, a, in a beneficial way? Yeah. The, at the very core of it is the demonization of fear. So we are told by all the quote unquote experts to be fearless, don't be scared. And from a young age, like parents do this, the world does this, don't be scared, don't worry, don't stress, don't feel guilty. We always say, don't feel what you feel. (laughs) Instead of saying, cool, feel what you feel. And that's okay to feel what you feel. There's nothing inherently wrong with you. So, and that's the problem. Like I've worked with one guy who said, I'm just waiting for the fear to go away so I can quit my job and start my business. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, you're, that's your fundamental problem. You're waiting for the fear to go away because he thought he should be, we're told all the time, just be confident as you step into action. Like you cannot be confident at something you've never done before. How are you going to be confident? You've never done it. It's going to be scary. Confidence is the result, not the fuel. So the fundamental in terms of the perception is to stop trying to be fearless. Stop trying to not be scared. If fear shows up, there's nothing wrong with you. Like it's not bad. You're not weak for feeling it. And this is a big problem. People feel they're weak for feeling fear. Like I've been climbing with people and they'll feel like, like I wasn't scared on an easy climb and they were, and they'll be like, you know, why weren't you scared? I'm scared means I was weak. And I'm like, no, the only reason I wasn't scared on that climb is because I've climbed 20 times more difficult things. So my brain has not perceived that to be a risk, not because I'm any more stronger or braver. It's because I have references, different references than you do. So right now you and me can be doing the same thing and my, and you could have different references than I do. So you might be scared or I might be scared because our brain perceives it differently based on our experiences. Right? So it's not, it's it's just, it's just accepting it. And this comes with practice, like just noticing and and a very simple way to do this is set an alarm on your phone every hour and just ask yourself, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? And notice it and just be with it. It's a very simple tool, but an extremely powerful one because what that does is it trains you to become aware of your thoughts and your feelings without judging them so that when the tougher emotions show up the fear the stress the anxiety the guilt whatever it may be there you you can acknowledge them without judging them and remember they're not bad they're more challenging than happiness and joy and calm and this that and the other thing but they're not bad they're just more challenging so when you train yourself to become aware of them without judging them you can then start building that second muscle of training them and doing something about them I've been for quite a few years now sort of leaning in and and through Empowered Kids really trying to teach families to embrace all emotions. But I will put my hand up and say fear has been one that I've kind of left on the back burner. Um, And even as you were talking, I've realized that that whole incident I just described for you where I stood on the wall. So I was literally on top of the wall. My two kids trying to get me down. My parents throwing those little balls that you have in ball pits at me going, get off the wall. (laughs) 
but I recognized that in that moment, I felt like I was weak. Mm. As you were saying that, like in that moment, apart from the fact that I didn't lean into fear, I also judged myself as being yeah. weak rather than recognizing that this was a space that I just needed more muscle for. Exactly. Um, Okay, let's talk about train because this one, I think a lot of people will be new to the idea of training for fear. Mm -hmm. So I want to start off by talking about what you mean by training for fear. And then I want to touch on some of the crazy things like you, like the seven days in darkness. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's go there. <laughs> got it. Got it. So Training in fear is ultimately like starting point is again, you can listen to me, read the books, all of that is going to be great, but nothing is going to teach you like the doing the greatest lessons are always in the doing, but you got to remember to your point, like you mentioned about the rock and feeling weak, like stepping into your fears at your level. Like, again, I was always like this. And so I'll give you a concrete example of this. I was working with this guy who was traveling to Iceland on his own. Like he was a client of mine and traveling to Iceland on his own. Not someone extreme debt defying expedition, just going into, you know, hotels, comfortable, but going on his own. And he was really scared. And so he hears stories like mine and he starts to feel of himself as weak, right? Because he's like, you do all these crazy things. Why are you not scared? And why am I scared going along? And the thing is, and we do that all the time. We compare ourselves to others and, uh, and we hear, and that guy does it. I should not be scared. But the thing is, his brain just didn't have the references minded. I had built and I've built it over time. So what we first did was like, dude, you're feeling the fear. Like, don't judge that. It's okay. You've never traveled alone. That's, that's okay. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you're any weaker or stronger than me. We're just human beings with different references. Uh, and I've built mine over time. So as you do first, so you, the point is you're taking one step into the fear. Once he does that, now what? Suddenly he's more confident to now step to take off vacation on his own. Then what? Okay, let me find the next edge the next edge, the next edge. And you keep pushing that line. And that's all I've done to get to where I am today. As I said, I used to be terrified of even Ferris wheels. So finding slow little, like pushing your edge just one step and recognizing that you're not weaker or stronger than anybody else. It's just that they have different references that they've all built up over time. Nobody is born some superhuman soul. Or arguably, we all are born superhuman. But the point is that we, 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 what we choose to do with our lives and the references we cultivate through personal experience, they change us. I've become extremely confident by stepping. And that's why, so when I joined, when I came out of the Marines, I was doing things like skydiving and rock climbing and cave diving. Like literally every one of these things terrified me, as I mentioned about the skydiving. So I was doing them to build myself into a stronger person one, one inch at a time, one step at a time. And so little like techniques you can do is visualizing yourself like visualizing yourself moving through the fear. You can get clarity on what's on the other side of the fear. Like, why am I doing this thing, right? Like knowing your strong why, really really being clear about that. Another technique that is like the five whys technique. And this is more for fears that are like um, longer fears as opposed to like jumping out of a plane. You just jump, right? And once you jump, you got nowhere to go. You're going to fall and there's like a kind of bliss there. But like, for example, like the fear of writing a book, it's kind of this longer fear. So asking yourself, why am I scared? Understanding the fear. What am I scared of? What's the worst case scenario? How do I prepare for the worst case scenario? So when you dig deep into the fear, you can understand the core of it. Now, often it will stem into some, often if you really dig deep enough of a fear, it will stem into one of two things, generally speaking, fear of not being good enough, fear of not belonging. Human beings, like that's, we kind of have that. And people even say, you know, don't, don't like, don't stop feeling like you're not good enough. Who cares if you feel like you're not good enough? I feel like I'm not good enough. Great. Do something about it. Like, <laughs> you know, so you train yourself to not even make that a bad thing. And, and the best in the world have talked about this. Like you will hear the, the greatest singers, the greatest athletes, they still feel like, oh, am I worthy? I was reading somewhere that like after interviews with Oprah, tons of people who are celebrities, the best in the world at what they do would say, uh, was I, was I okay? Did I do a good job? You know? And so the thing is you feel not good enough. Great. Let me strive to get a little better, you know, <laughs> and you keep training. So you train your mind to say it's not about ever being, quote unquote, enough or at the result. It's about the process, that growth mindset, right? Like constantly the growth mindset, overcoming one step at a time. So digging deep into the fears and then using that to prepare. Like one of my mantras, another one is fear propels you to prepare. So if you engage the fear, you can understand the fear and then you can use it to prepare. So like when I was skiing across Greenland, 
I dig deep. Why am I scared? What's the fear? I mean, I could literally die. So I was like, okay, what can I do to prepare? So I used to drag tires around the streets of New Jersey for hours on end. And it was freaking miserable, right? Miserable. But I trained for the battle that I knew I was stepping into. Same thing with writing a book. I was terrified that it'd be garbage. Nobody want to read it. One star review on Amazon for, you know, all that kind of stuff I was terrified of. And what if people think I'm stupid, all that? So what did I do? I studied from better authors on how to write a good book. And that's what I did. So it's all about using the fear to prepare for the potential outcome you were scared of and then putting yourself out there. I want to talk about training in relation to training using one fear. So for instance, um, I have a, a mastermind of uh, entrepreneur women that work together, kind of helping each other. Um, mm. And literally about two weeks before I found Fair Vana, we decided we were going to do a fair challenge. 12 fears across 12 months, um, mm. making a list of our biggest fears. Because really, and I'll tell you what, I feel like the fear of falling is just something that if I let go of that fear, I will lose some of the other things that I'm carrying. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, if you're training in, let's say I'm, let's use falling as an example. So if you're training in that fear, so I go up on that wall and I climb and I climb, and then I decide, okay, ultimately I'm going skydiving and we're just going to work on that. Is that training going to transpire into fear of, in the business realm, fear of being judged, fear of failure in business? Mm -hmm. Or is training for fear specific? Like I have to train for each fear. Fantastic question. So it's kind of a yes and a no. So it does transpire in the sense that it will make you more confident. Like that's what it, like doing all the things that I've done. It does make me more confident in other realms, like in building my business. But the key thing also is to recognize that is it's important to come back from the, the battle, if you will, whatever you're confronting the fear and reflect on it, to learn from it. And this is something I didn't used to do. I used to go jumping out of planes, this, that, and the other thing, and just like, really, okay, great. Now what's the next one? Next. But now, now another, another mantra is stretch and reflect. So stretch and reflect, stretch and reflect. And you're constantly doing that. And so if you look at it, like the stretching line is going to go further and further, but you come back, you learn. What did I learn from this? How can I apply it? What did I take from this? How can I, how can I use the principles that I got from this in the other areas of my life and the other fight? And there's also another key thing that I've been learning is that, see, some of these fears like jumping out of a plane or rock climbing, it's, a, it's an immediate return environment. So the, 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 it's, it's more instant, right? Like once you, so I might be terrified this whole ride sitting up a plane, but once I jump, you're kind of in bliss. You're in this free fall. All is, all is well. In yes. business or writing, yeah, <laughs> and it really is. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but but like with business, it's longer drawn out. So in business and in like normal life, it's a delayed return environment. So what I mean by that is evolutionary speaking again. Delayed return means I could like I could study hard. I don't know if I'm actually going to get into the college I want to. I could work my butt off on this marketing campaign. I don't exactly know how it's going to convert. But immediate return environment is the stressors are acute. So. Like in evolutionary speaking, the lion is after me. I run away from the lion, stress gone, right? In business, I do all these things. I'm constantly stressed because I just never know how it's going to pan out, right? Mm -hmm. So the return is delayed. So, what to, so, so in some sense, it's a different fight in the way you perceive it. So you have to recognize, and this is something that, again, I've learned over time, is that it's like to this day, it's easier for me to go out and suffer on a run than it is to work on a marketing campaign for those exact reasons. Because on a run, I know it's completely up to me. I have to suffer. I can crawl. I can walk, but I will get there. In a business environment, I, don't, I can put in, and the best copywriters, for example, will tell you this, right? You could be the best copywriter in the world, and they will write copy for a sales letter, and they still don't know exactly how it's going to convert. And the best copywriters will still have failed campaigns. So the key thing is you have to reframe how you view it to some degree, and, the, and ultimately, it's ultimately bring those same principles from immediate return into the delayed return. So what do I mean by that? is recognizing that no matter how many pivots I take, so the pivots are gonna be more. It's not as simple as suffering my way into the 24 hours, right? Or 100 miles, or whatever it may be. It's gonna take more tweaks, adapting, improving, but ultimately knowing that I will still get there. And then the key thing is falling in love with the process. So it's not, although it's good to have a target, we all need a target and we, I believe we should have goals and a target, but the target is in the back of my mind. So then what I'm doing is I'm falling in love with the process. So I'm not celebrating. So for example, let's say I write a sales letter. 
I'm not celebrating the fact that I got a hundred sales. What I'm celebrating is dude, I just worked my butt off for an entire week to write a sales letter. And that's what produced this hundred sales. I'm not like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Result happened. And of course we, we want the sales. We need to grow our business, but what I'm celebrating is the effort. And that's the essence of the growth mindset. We don't reward talent. We reward effort. Parents is like, this is a huge thing. Don't praise your kids for talent. Praise them for effort. Dr. Carol Dweck has done a lot of really fascinating studies. You obviously know about them on mindset. So it's the same thing for ourselves, rewarding ourselves for the effort, falling in love with the process of it. And that kind of, that's the way to mold the delayed return environment into an immediate return environment, if that makes sense. It does. So I think I can see some of the physical fears, like fear of falling, easier yeah. to map out how I will train myself in that mm -hmm. space. In the personal development world, we use the term limiting belief, but I think behind all of that is just fear. Um, and and, support, and yeah. this is one of the reasons Here's I like your five, your five whys, because I think when you can identify your limiting belief, because sometimes it's easy to identify that, but not the fear beneath it. Yeah. Asking those five yeah. whys kind of takes you a bit deeper. Yeah. But sometimes I find like in that realm, so like if you take it back to business, so I know a lot of people who allow their limiting beliefs and their fears that lay beneath those to hold them back from taking the action they need mm -hmm. to in business. Mm -hmm. So they have a great goal. They have all the ability and the capability to do it, but they get stuck. How do you practice in that environment versus the, the sort of um, physical things like climbing the walls yeah. and running? It's you reducing it to the smallest, simplest action. So I was working with this one guy who was terrified of writing. Every time he would get on the computer to write, he would literally have like severe anxiety, sweaty palms. And he would, what would he do? He'd go to watch TV. Simple thing, right? Shut off my mind, numb the mind. Let's go do that and to, to watch TV. That's always the easiest course of action. So really simplifying it. And in my book, I talk about the LMNOP tool. So I won't go in detail now about that, but basically using that to just, let's, let's just write for two minutes. So just two minutes. Two minutes then becomes five. So the other day, this I did this in even the physical realm, same principle, but like I was doing a two a day. I didn't I was too exhausted. I didn't want to go for my second, my second part like run of the day. But I said, all right, let me just go for one mile. Even if it's just one mile, at least I got my two a day. One mile ended up becoming five miles because now I started, right? So, and I and I kind of knew that would happen because at this point I'm trained for it. So just starting small. And one and the big thing is to recognize that it's not gonna go away. Like no matter what I say, and not and is the struggle's not gonna go away. And don't wait for it to go away. Like they, so people kind of hear if, if like they're looking for the tool to make the struggle go away. And that's the biggest problem. Like I was on one interview and somebody asked me like a specific scenario. Okay. Let's say somebody's going through a divorce. How would you handle this? And the thing is, I was like, you could throw me any specific scenario you want. The fundamental problem at a higher level is that no matter what the scenario, everybody is looking for the easiest, least painful path <laughs> out of it. That is the problem. And I get it because Pain is inherently painful. That's the nature of pain. But that's the fundamental problem is not like I'm not nobody's going to give you a hack or a tool to make the pain and the struggle of that to go away. But the more you do it, the more you confront it, the more you train in it, the more you build yourself to now that's why the essence of fear of Bonna, the fundamental essence to help people develop positive relationship to suffering. Like I want to like when people come in the world of fear of Bonna, and just forget about the world of fear of Bonna, in life, I want people to hear the word fear, stress, anxiety, suffering, pain, adversity, and be like sweet. Awesome. Like I want that to trigger a smile in their brain and say, that is awesome. Bring it. Like, lo I love it. You know? And if you do that, you start to fall in love with the experience. You start to fall, even when it sucks, you fall in love with it. You're like, great. I love it. And you turn yourself into the person who has a self identity that look, I might never be good enough. I might have this, that, and the other love limiting belief. Like, cool. I'm going to fall in love with all of that and stay in the fight anyway. You know what I mean? Like I constantly feel never good enough. I constantly feel anxiety that I'm never going to get to where I want to go in my business. Cause I have all these insanely grand audacious goals. I'm terrified of my next adventure. I literally just finished my 24 hour run planning the next one beyond terrified of how miserable it's going to be. And I'm just like, awesome. Like I'm falling in. So you want to cultivate your self identity about the person who fights the, and you can use your term, own terminology. If you don't like the word fight and the person who grows, who struggles, who, who's in the battle of it, you know, as opposed to like, I'm like, don't be the kind of person who goes into a room where you're the smartest person in the room and you feel good to yourself, feel good about yourself when you're the person who's the stupidest person in the room, because you know what, now I'm going to learn. So cultivate that self identity that I'm the learner, not like I need to be great. I'm the learner. And that's what it's all about about is constantly embracing that. I love that. And I'll share an example from my family where accidentally that happened. So a few years ago, when my kids were younger, I have two boys, um, Tony Robbins invited us to UPW in London. And my youngest son was seven at the time. And he did the firewalk. 
And I think um, it gave him a perception that he could do anything beyond mm. anything as parents we would have been able to give him. Mm. And it allowed him as a kid to be able quite easily to dream the biggest dreams mm. without ever questioning or doubting that he could achieve it. He just knew that anything was possible for him mm-hmm. um, in a way that I love. But you still need to support him through the process. Like, so while he dreams big, yeah, and, and he's got big goals in terms of what he would like to achieve from yeah. self career wise, but there's a process to learn in those skills. And he still needs support in that. So I love that you're saying it's twofold. See yourself as the type of person I like fight. So fight works for me, right? See yourself yeah. as the person <laughs> who, who, will, who will be in the fight, who is yeah. willing to fight to make it to the other side. Uh, but then recognize when that fear comes up, rather than trying to run from it, you can break it down into smaller pieces to make your way through it. Exactly. I absolutely love that. Exactly. Um, there are two things, and I want to start to talk about how as parents we shape the narrative for kids. So the first thing is you said there's a lot of advice of don't compare yourself to others, be positive, eliminate your ego, and you recognize these as destructive myths. And I'll say all parents have said this to their kids. So, <laughs> so help us break down why these are myths and what we should be saying instead. Sure. So let's start with the first one is uh, don't compare yourself to others, right? So the brain, I've kind of touched on the word references, right? The brain operates on references. So naturally, we compare at a very simple level. Why do I like this blender as opposed to that other blender? Because I've compared it with anything. Like, why do I like this vacation? Because I'll compare it to another vacation. Our brain operates on references. So Dr. Dan Ariel, a psychologist, uh, wrote this book called Predictably Irrational. He has a great quote about that, about how our brain operates everything based on references. So when we say don't compare ourselves to others, we're basically saying the same thing of don't feel what you feel, don't do what the brain's going to do that you can't control anyway. If I look at somebody else, I'm going to compare myself. The brain does that. So the key is then twofold, is one, controlling your references. So this is why social media can be extremely destructive because we're going to get on there and we're going to compare ourselves to others no matter what. So one is controlling your references. This is like a big thing. When people are in a low state, like people have come to me and ask me, you know, how do I help somebody with addiction and all that kind of stuff? Telling them how, let's say, awesome I am is not helpful. And I'm not saying this in a bragging way. People have literally said, I told them your story and it didn't help. I'm like, yeah, it's not going to help because it's only going to make them feel worse about themselves. That guy is awesome, but I'm, and I, I went through it. Like when I was in that state, I didn't want to hear about how awesome anybody is. It only makes me feel worse about myself. So that's a whole separate conversation how to navigate that. But the point is, one part is controlling the references. And the other part is recognizing when the comparison does show up, you notice it. And again, you don't judge it. You don't try to make it go away. Okay, cool. I'm comparing myself to him. Okay, God, well, great. What can I learn from him? Like jealousy and envy is not a negative emotion. Jealousy and envy is a compass. Okay, why, why am I jealous of that guy and not that guy and not that guy? Okay, there's something about that guy that's saying, hmm, what do I want about that life? Let me understand it. Okay, I'm comparing myself to him. I'm jealous of this. Great. Okay, that's a compass for me. Let me now work towards it because I'm falling in love with the person who is the worker, right? Like what we talked about earlier. So there's kind of the two parts. The, but, and, but it's really important to also acknowledge that first part is controlling your references because you don't want to be like, constantly battling the, the, the brain and stuff. So eliminate that so you can stay focused on your mission. Like you're, it's your path that matters. And when you need it, you can look at somebody for inspiration. You can look at somebody to learn what they did, how they did it. That is vitally important. I'm big into mentors, coaches, having that structure, mastermind that like you said you run, totally all into that. But you're doing it consciously with purpose, with intention, not arbitrarily just scrolling through Instagram today and being like, oh, there's 20 other runners who are better than me. And I know, I know, for example, I'm not the best runner. You know, I'm not the fastest, but I can look at a runner and learn from it. And other times be like, you know what? I'm just going to sideline it and just focus on my, this is my track. I'm going to stay in my lane. So staying in your lane with like relentless focus. I mean, you know, the horse blinkers kind of thing, like put those on and just shut off the world. I'm in this lane. You know what I mean? So that's part of it. So that was the first one. What was the second one? Um, uh, be positive. Be positive. Yeah. So let's talk about that one. So this, I'll give you again, a concrete story about this. I was at, I did a talk in India and this woman came up to me uh, after, after fear of honor. And she'd been through horrible things like beaten in a marriage, ex-husband, a broken arm, like horrible, horribly abusive, physical and, and emotional uh, marriage that she'd been through. And thankfully she left. So she'd let all, all the spiritual books now and all the personal development. And she came to me after my talk and she said, so it sounds like you're not just saying be positive all the time. I said, well, do you still have negative thoughts? And she goes, yeah. I said, of course you do. If you've gone through that stuff, you're going to confront dark things in your mind. 
And the idea is not just like, no, life is great. All is good. Let me just focus on the positive. The idea is you want to use the negative, channel the negative. So if you had somebody in life tell you you're worthless, you're never going to amount to anything. Great. Use it. You know, don't run away from it. Don't try to sugarcoat it because look, life is hard. We're going to, and it's not all, I, I know I tend to talk about suffering a lot. So a lot of people are like, it's, I'm not trying to paint a big, bleak picture, but look, we go through dark times in life. And like I, like I mentioned, like a concrete example of that is my friend who I felt like, or, you know, you should have died in the war. Great. Earn this life, you know? And, and I'm not saying I, I live in that dark space. The key thing is when you want to go into the negative, into the darkness of it, you're not living it there. You're using it to bring it. So ultimately you're using it to, as solutions to come into po positive solutions. So yes, we are bringing into the positive frame as a, as a purposeful action, but the, 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 but mostly when people here be positive, it's, they're not, they're not going into the darkness. They're not going into the negative of whatever life maybe have thrown into them and learning to confront that and learning to use it as a tool to, to drive them forward into purposeful action. Instead of just saying life is all sunshine, rainbows, everything is good. And, uh, and trying to avoid confronting the whatever darkness, we all have our own flavor of that, right? Everybody's confronted their own stuff in life. So you want to use the negative, use, use it as fuel and turn it into a solution focused um, uh, solution focused tool to access your mission. And there's really simple ways to do that is like to turn barriers into questions. Mm. So a barrier statement is like a wall, but a question is a door. So like I was working with this one kid who said, I don't have money for college. Now, if I do that, you're just a victim, right? I'm a donor money for college and a very real situation. Like kid was in some ex extreme poverty. So yeah, it's real, but we're not going to make ourselves victims. Instead, we're going to say, Okay, how can I make money for college? Are there scholarships available? Who do I have to become to be worthy of those scholarships? So that's a simple way to turn like a problem into a solution. But in, in the key thing, again, there's using that darkness. Like I've had moments where when I was running across Liberia, I ran 167 miles across Liberia to help build a school out there. I was at a moment once when my shin was hurting and I, and I was sprinting with this aching shin pain. And the whole time I was telling myself, you should have died in the war, earn this life. People are suffering and dying all around you right now. Suck it up. If you quit now, you deserve a coward's death. And that's like dark, negative, quote unquote, negative things to say, right? But that was the fastest five miles I ran that entire trip. <laughs> and again, I'm not saying I always do that. Like I'm not always in that space. But when you access the darkness, when you venture into the darkness, when you tap into the negative, you can use it as fuel and you can then, then play with it. You have the darkness and the light and you can decide what you want to use when you want to use it. But you have to go into both spaces. Don't just try to stay in the light. I love that. I think... For me, what you've just described is the essence of life and the place that we get trapped in. I think we all get to acknowledge that there are painful moments in life or discomfort, even if you want to say it's not painful. But the reality is all change happens by first recognizing some, mm -hmm. some sort of discomfort. Mm -hmm. But I think the people that are really good at making positive change are really good at channeling that discomfort mm -hmm. into positive action. Mm -hmm. Whereas those that there are lots of others that feel the same discomfort, but they get lost in that discomfort. Mm -hmm. And so they never take the positive action needed to bring about yeah. change. And I think what you've just said is just so beautiful. Cause for me, once you can master that, you really are mastering your own life. Absolutely. That's the essence. Yeah. That's the falling essence. In love, falling in love with the suffering and then taking purposeful action. Yeah. Um, so I think as parents, what we've done, <laughs> what we've done in the last few decades is to try to make life as pain free as possible for our kids, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> as pain free. So understanding that fear is going to come up, discomfort is going to come up and your ability to be able to manage that as it comes up in life really depends on the experience you've had with it and the muscle you've built. How would you, what guidance would you give to parents in terms of moving away from that cushion that they've been creating for their kids and creating spaces where their kids get the ability to train and fear? Yeah. You got to let your kids suffer. Let them fall. Let them take risks and do it in all kinds of, I know it's hard, right? Parents <laughs> don't want to, but you, you're not. And I see this, like, I cannot tell you how I see this in India. Like you, like my extended family, my uh, family, friends. Like in India, I mean, all over the world, I see this in the US and the UK, everywhere, but it, I, I see it a lot in, in India, especially like the affluent in India, they will have like shelter their kids to like, no, like you cannot believe, you know, maids around them to protect them and you're not helping them. I, I see the effects of it. I see the effects on kids who have seen grow up and they've been sheltered their whole life. Mm -hmm. So for parents, like let them suffer, teach them how to suffer. Let the, because here's the thing, 
in the real world, nobody cares about you. The life is going to punch you in the face. And I'm not saying like, again, I'm not trying to be bleak, but like, you know, it's reality. <laughs> so if you think you're protecting your kids, when they get out of the real world, the world's not going to treat them the way you do as their parent. So right now they have a protective comfort zone because the risk is, and I'm not saying drop them into a war zone, obviously, right? Like I'm not saying, I'm not like out of my mind, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm not saying do something crazy, like, but teach them. I mean, like a very good example of this is I was with my Marine buddy and um, at his wedding and I saw another Marine buddy there and his kid like was running and fell. The kid fell. Now I, I was like, you know, before I could go, the, 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 his dad was like, nope, don't do anything. The kind of dad looked away. Kid got up on his own and then the dad went and be like, hey, you okay? He's like, yeah, good. And the kid moved on. So what did he teach him? He taught the kid he could get up on his own, but he also taught the kid, hey, I'm here for you. Like, so when the kid got up, he, he said, I'm here. Whereas, and I can tell you this, and I've seen this firsthand, and the kid falls in India, 70 people on them to like pick him up. And they're like, <laughs> and again, I'm not saying universally in India, but like, I see this with my, like with people I know, uh, who are going to be hating on me if they see this, if they see your show, but uh, they'll be like jumping on that kid to pick him up. Like, let the kid fall. Let the kids suffer. Go up my, like, like take, I don't, it can be anything. You can go rock climbing, like teach them how to suffer. And then when, they, when they're dealing with it, ask them, okay, cool. Like talk to them about it. What did you learn? What's the struggle? You know, like asking, like um, I did this with one friend of mine as a result of a conversation with me. Every night she asked the kids, so what, how did you, I forget how she worded, she came up with her own version of it, but like, how did you struggle today? What mm -hmm. challenge did you go through today? So teach them that struggle is part of life. Teach them to fall in love with it. Great. Okay, you struggled. What did you learn? Okay, cool. Awesome. Don't try to say like, because life's going to beat them down when they get out of your little protective world that <laughs> your parents, and again, I know it's, I know it's hard because parents and my parents are the same way. Indian parents loved me great. And I, I love my parents super close to them. But like to this day, I kind of joke with them. I was like, y'all made me soft, you know, <laughs> you should have made me suffer more. Uh, but I taught myself to suffer by joining the Marines and doing everything I do now. So, and I couldn't be more grateful for it. Couldn't be more grateful for it. Uh, so yeah, just like, and there's all kinds of ways to do it. Like take them out running, take them out to, and when, or take them, make, go work out with them when they rock climb. And when they fall, be like, good, get back up, kid. Like if they're suffering in pain, like mommy, I'm hurting, great, get back up. <laughs> like, you know, I'm not saying you'll be like total hard ass or anything, but like teach them that it's okay to hurt. It's normal to hurt. And they're not, and, and like to, and to get back, to face that pain and to keep moving through it. I love that. You know what I love about that? I, I always think of family life as the training ground. This is the training yeah. ground before I release you. And I like that in the training ground, I'm saying you can fall um, and I know you can get back up. I believe in your capability. Yeah, exactly. And, and when you need me, I'm here. Exactly. Yeah, because that, like if I think back to my own life as a child, knowing that I had a, a, a village behind me, that was sort of my sense of comfort that allowed me to take mm -hmm. risks. Yeah. Um, and so I think that those elements together are really powerful. Um, I want to touch now before, before I ask my final question on your seven days of darkness. <laughs> um, I want to talk about what did it give you in terms of the push of being able to understand and master your own mind? what the like the, the seven days in darkness seven days of darkness um and you, and you probably just give give our audience a uh, um a brief description of what I, when i say seven days of darkness what we're talking about yeah so i was literally in a an isolated room completely alone uh complete i chose to be completely silent pitch darkness cannot see your hand in front of you 24 7 for seven full days so you have literally nowhere to go but within nothing external to attach consciousness to because you can't see so you it's like even if even if you're in a lighted room you know you can see a wall you can see something there's nothing there's nowhere external to go so you have to go with it and uh the reason i did it was after going through the divorce i had broken my sobriety and i didn't like that so i wanted to go kind of deeper within and i didn't know darkness retreats were like a thing i was actually going to go to one of those silent retreats but probably as you've gathered from hearing me now that I choose to the most extreme path to pursue things. <laughs> so when I found darkness retreats, I was like, sweet, that's what I'm going to go do. Go sit in darkness for seven days. Cause why not? Uh, <laughs> and so, so that's why I chose to do it is to confront uh, my, cause I had a fear of stillness and I would argue everybody has a fear of stillness. It's not like if you ask somebody, are you scared? Like, what are you scared of? I would, you know, most people are never going to say stillness, but we all have that. And that's why we live in a world of distractions, right? I'm going to use my phone, computer, TV, like something other to distract ourselves from being with ourselves. So for me, what it taught me, I mean, many things, I was actually journaling in the dark. Like I was actually writing and, and had a journal in the dark. 
uh, and uh, and to to see what would come up. But like what it what what like a big lesson for me that came up personally and just in navigating my own demons was more permission to feel happy because for a long time in my life I'd felt really guilty for feeling happy because I've like beyond just the experiences I've shared with you I've you know I've worked in places of extreme poverty volunteered in leper colonies worked with survivors of sex trafficking you know I've seen the darkness of the human condition being in a war zone and I've always felt like why do I get to be happy like there's so many people right now as you and me are sitting here there's people in the absolute hell on earth somewhere in the world right and it's like why do I get this when so many people are suffering and confronting that at a deepest level was very powerful for me to recognize that, look, me being happy is not going to change the, the suffering in the world. But if anything, it's going to help me work harder because I'm not going to be sitting in this guilt about it uh, to, to do something about it, you know? So the, the stuff that came through in my journal was very, 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 very powerful for me. Um, uh, there was a lot of, again, insights on abstract questions that like, what's the nature of God? What's the, what does enlightenment mean? Why are we here? What's the meaning of life? And again, I'm not saying my answers were right answers, but the answers that came to me, because I don't think there's a right answer, but with the answers that came to me were answers that satisfied me. You know, like these que ex existential questions I've struggled with for a long time. Uh, so I got a lot, but I, I would say like, if I had to say one, one thing, by far the most profound experience was actually coming back in the light after seven days. So after <laughs> seven days and sitting, like seeing the world and the way it looked, I mean, I was literally cheering up, like just the profundity of that experience. I remember thinking two things. One was, I wish I could look at the world every day through these eyes because mm -hmm. it, it looks, I mean, you're seeing the world through different eyes. And the second thing was, which was perhaps the most powerful was in a very visceral way, knowing that you cannot truly understand the light unless you have been in the dark. Mm -hmm. So I felt this deep sense of gratitude for every bit of suffering, pain, struggle I've ever experienced because you cannot truly understand the light unless you have been in the dark. And so what that does is now to teach others and to teach myself that when darkness shows up, and as we all know, it does, it's a part of the experience that it's the part of the access to greater light. And you cannot really, you won't like anybody who hasn't gone, everybody goes through again, their own version of suffering. So it's not about like who goes to what version, but you're never going to truly understand the highs or the summits unless you've been in the valleys, right? Like to confront the darkness, to face that darkness, to be in the darkness, you'll see light in a way that you've never seen before. I love it. I love it. And you know what I love about it as well? I love the, in some instance, the, the reason for going through that bit of the journey. I love that you're saying after all of this training, sometimes things come up in life that still throw you off your course. Yeah. Uh, and you still have to continue to train. And the more you train, the more you'll find. And the more you discover yeah. about yourself. And that's just beautiful. Okay, Ashley, tell us where we can find out more about your work online. You can find me at fearvana.com. That's F-E-A-R-V-A-N-A, fearvana.com. And then the book is also available on Amazon in Kindle, Audible, and paperback. And 100% of the profits go to charity. We support many amazing causes like former child soldiers in West Africa, the survivors of sex trafficking in India. So all the profits go to charity. You can find me there as well. Beautiful. All right. My last question. What does it mean to you to live a truly empowered life? To live a truly empowered life, I believe, is to keep seeking that next awakening, to keep seeking that next level of growth, because it's on the journey is the destination. The journey is a, it's all about that seeking. So constantly striving for that next uh, level, the next level, the next greatest version of yourself. And there's no end, right? That's the beauty of the journey. Until death, we can keep seeking the next stage. And I think empowerment is that seeking, that search, and the willingness to take action on that path, uh, no matter where you are. We all have our own different levels or different journey, but as long as you are striving for you to become that next version of yourself, I believe that's living an empowered life. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Askia. This Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much for having me. Really a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Empowered Kids TV. I'd like you to do us two favors. If this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe and press the bell icon so we can notify you of upcoming episodes and you don't miss any of our amazing programs. And if you found value, please share it. It still takes a village. So share this with your family and friends. As we always say here at Empowered Kids TV, you're just one connection away. With love and gratitude, Empowerers. Until next time.